Well, welcome everybody to this session. Uh, since the coronavirus pandemic really kicked off in earnest last spring, a whole group of us at the LSE have come together to form a research group, the COVID and Care Research Group. And we've been looking at various ways in which uh, anthropological insights can be used to inform policy and help contribute both to the, the management of the pandemic and also laying the foundations for recovery from the pandemic as we look to the future. So four of us are here today to tell you a little bit about the work we've been doing, how anthropology really can make a difference and what it's like being an anthropologist in pandemic times. Uh, so We'll just introduce ourselves to begin with. My name's Nick Long. I'm an associate professor at the LSE. And my particular area of interest and, and focus during the pandemic has been looking at the idea of social bubbles or different ways of imagining how social networks might be reconfigured as people live through lockdowns and other pandemic control, control measures. Hello, I'm Laura Baer and I'm a professor of anthropology here at LSE and I'm also head of department. And during the pandemic, I've become centrally involved in government policy by being a member of SPI-B and the SST subgroups in SAGE. And I've in particular brought an anthropological interest in humans as social beings to decision making and questions of inequality as well. Behavioural science usually looks at the individual apart from their communities. But as an anthropologist, I've really brought an understanding of how people's communities are being affected, new inequalities that are arising within them, and how social support has been changed due to government interventions and COVID-19. I'm Caroline Bazenbanza. I'm in my MRes year of an anthropology PhD programme. And with the COVID and Care Project, I've been working, talking to mothers, um, early years providers and women who have given birth during the pandemic. Um, hi, I'm Melina Worth. Um, I graduated from with a BA in anthropology in summer 2020, and now I'm working as a research assistant with the COVID and Care Research Group. Um, and I began doing some survey analysis, and now I've uh, started doing some field work of my own. Um, virtually, of course, and so it's been just a really great collaborative experience, and I hope to continue on until the, the project finishes up. Great, and you were both, Caroline and Melina, you were both undergraduates here at mm -hmm. the LSE, weren't you? So you can also like, maybe uh, share with our listeners a little bit about the experience of, of what that was like. But I mean, first, I mean, Laura, you, you've spoken a little bit about why anthropology can bring something distinctive to the table. I mean, maybe could you, you could elaborate on that a little bit more. What is it you think that makes anthropology necessary for projects of um, pandemic response? I mean, obviously alongside other disciplines, but why when you've got people who are specialists in public health or psychology or sociology, why do you need anthropology as well? What does anthropology add? Anthropology looks not just at social relationships, but also of the impact of institutions on them. So anthropology brings into frame that sort of relationship between society and, and the government. So we've been living in a really strange time under COVID where we've been in a state of exception where the government, in a sense, could justify you know, intervening in many, many ways in our lives. And so anthropology allows you to look at that kind of interaction with, you know, childcare issues, with elder care issues, with um, how communities are supporting themselves through mutual aid groups, and to what extent the government is able to support or is undermining all of those kinds of social support networks. So again, it looks at this kind of social calculus of policy in terms of its social impacts. Um, and that's been really important in several ways uh, during the response to the pandemic. First of all, related to your work too in New Zealand on support bubbles, these ways in which we could keep connections going during the pandemic that were first introduced in New Zealand. That then became an example that I could take to say in order to think about how to recover after the first wave in the UK from these loss of these really vital social support networks. And I could sort of argue for how important those might be in the second wave um, and in, in the future. Um, and also in terms of local interventions, there were these local um, lockdowns back in uh, June last year, and we'll probably be going into a phase of those again. But those, of course, have really negative effects on communities again. They're both uh, kind of stigmatizing in some ways. They make certain areas seem to be densely you know, filled with transmission events, but also they're experienced at uh, community and individual level as stigmatizing. So we were able to suggest ways in which those could be handled better through using ethnographic research and through the very language that you 
used to talk about them. So as a result, they, the government they certainly stopped calling them local in, local lockdowns and started to call them local interventions. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's great to see that impact. And I think certainly from my experience, one of the things that I think anthropology is really powerful in is being able to capture the points of view, the voices of people who are directly affected by policy measures and use that as uh, a basis of intervention. So it's not just thinking about what you imagine a community would want, but it's actually based on your knowledge of the perspectives of the people that you know and have worked with for, I mean, sometimes really quite a long time. Uh, so when I was thinking about this bubbles research that I did, my first point of inspiration for that was actually um, work that I'd done teaching my kinship, sex and gender course that both Caroline and Melinda took where uh, there's a lecture on HIV and AIDS and exploring how uh, measures in Uganda and South Africa were developed or proposed that tried to understand sexual networks in a way that kind of fitted with local ideas about sexuality and local ideas about the body so that you could have a measure that kind of best fitted the needs and interests and concerns of people that were living uh, in, in these countries uh, whilst still working to prevent the spread of HIV. And I wondered, you know, would it be possible to do something similar with COVID? And then the, the New Zealand case of social bubbles was an interesting prototype to do some research on and find out you know, what were its pros, what, what were its cons. Um, because I think you know, then you really are getting close to people's needs. And if you're doing an economic analysis, you would of course have specialists who see, well, how is this sector affected? How is that sector affected? You'd have that very kind of differentiated analysis to make sure that the needs of all the different sectors were met as far as possible. But I think sometimes in terms of thinking about how societies are affected, it can be a very top-down approach where we talk about education, where we talk about preserving health, and all of that is important, but we're not seeing how all the different constituencies, different situations different needs are are being affected mm -hmm. and i think that's where an anthropological perspective can be really really valuable i mean i see you're nodding caroline mm -hmm. so i'm glad to agree. <laughs> you know, how, how has that come through in your own work that you've been doing um i think what i've really enjoyed about the covid and care project is it's allowed us to kind of really listen to the voices and narratives of the people who are being affected by the policy kind of in real time and to really consider like how the how policy differently affects different groups of people. My, my particular focus has especially been black women who have been birthing during the pandemic. And so it's been really interesting to gain kind of an insight on all of these intersections and how they manifest in the actual experience of something quite existential, for example, birth. Um, and that's something I really learned throughout the undergraduate actually was that anthropology kind of offers a way to privilege people's voices and experiences in the world. Um, whilst at the same time kind of challenging the way that we produce knowledge in academia generally. And I think that's something that makes it quite distinctive from other disciplines. Yeah, I mean, would you agree with that, Milena? How has your anthropological training shaped the work that you're doing now to think about COVID? Yeah, I think it, looking back at undergrad, it's been really remarkable just how many of the themes that we discussed in class are now coming into play in front of our eyes. And I think to be able to um, just look at what's going around us on around us from the perspective of an anthropological researcher has been just so enriching for me this year. Um, I think a great thing about the COVID and care network too is it brought together people who are already specialists in certain areas of the country who are already deeply embedded in certain communities, which is something that we began learning how to do through our fieldwork units and in our dissertations third year. It's really kind of developing a specialty um, in a way unlike you would in any other discipline where you are just completely immersed in a certain community. And that's become incredibly valuable now with COVID, um, with the government reaching out, trying to find experts, trying to find people who know how these abstract things like trust and, and community are developed um, on the ground. And so it's been uh, just remarkable to see how much anthropologists can contribute because of the depth of their localized knowledge. Um, and also, myself being able to contribute because I live in London, I have a community of my own, and I've seen those changes happen in the very networks that are most dear and, and close to me, so. 
Can I pick up on a point that Caroline made about the politics of knowledge? Because the COVID and care group has been really special as well in this second phase, because we're kind of developing uh, radical forms of co-production. We've got a group of 13 young adults in Leicester and London and Derby that are helping us, um, actually are, are active researchers in their own communities on the impact of COVID within their own communities that we're bringing into the LSE to have conversations with us about their findings and to produce findings themselves. And we've also collaborated with a lot of community groups, with carers groups, with uh, radical groups trying to change processes of gentrification in London, like Just Space. So this has been collaborative in more ways than ones and has made us, you know, stretch the boundaries of, of who is producing knowledge as well mm -hmm. in really really interesting ways yeah, and it's amazing we're stretching the boundaries but then at the same time there is a sense in which anthropology has always been very collaborative mm -hmm. I think what i love about this project is it's forcing that collaboration to be front and center and fully acknowledged in ways that maybe it wasn't 10 20 years ago um because when you're doing anthropology you're going out you might be doing field work somewhere you become the expert but really what happens is you're synthesizing and compiling everyone else's expertise mm -hmm. and in that process you're able to bring your own insight but uh, you're really I, think I had a professor once who described anthropology as being like the great paper clip <laughs> uh, so maybe maybe kind of reduces it a bit but you're allowing these dialogues to be established and then when you come back from your field work you're then in conversation with colleagues who've also been working um, in their own context and you try and have a conversation with them and find the points of convergence the points of difference and through that comparison and collaboration understand the uh the world around us mm -hmm. and that can sometimes get kind of written out of becoming so and so is an expert in whatever it might be you know boxing in ghana mm -hmm. um but actually with this covid research project everyone's expertise gets put in dialogue actively within the research to think about a national policy response mm -hmm. and i think that's it's a really great way of doing research i just want to say again how invaluable that's been uh, within the government science committees because there's a kind of fetishization of big data and algorithms and kind of google mapping of activities and we're constantly getting into these conversations where we're finding patterns um, in that data, but no one can explain them unless mm -hmm. they turn to the anthropologist with, within the room who can explain, you know, why are people going to work and in more, you know, more of them at this point in the, in the wave or, you know, really tragic things as well. Like, you know, why is there a higher loss within, within some ethnic minority communities than others in, in the second wave? But th those patterns can't be exp explained without the anthropologists that turning, you know, using their knowledge, but then turning to local experts, which would be ordinary members of the public who are living these experiences, who we who we learn from. And so I see my role and the role of this group as well, kind of amplifying those voices and taking them into those sort of corridors of power and saying, look, you know, this is why things are happening. You're seeing mm -hmm. it happen. I'll explain it. So we've talked a little bit about some of the contributions that our group's research has made um, so far, the ways we've been able to um, lead to a, a tweaking or a revision of these local interventions, the way we've been able to uh, highlight the advantages of bubble type schemes, which now become integral to the, the most recent sort of January 2021 onwards lockdown. Um, it's the most recent when we're recording it. Hope, don't know if it'll be the most recent when <laughs> people are listening to this, hopefully. Um, in terms of going forward and thinking about a post-COVID world, or at least a kind of a post-vaccination world or a post-lockdown world, I don't know whether or not it will be strictly post-COVID, how can anthropology contribute to that? Because there's been a lot of debate that's saying well, what COVID has done is it's really sort of shone an X-ray through our society and revealed all the kinds of vulnerabilities and inequalities and fragilities, uh, as well as creating new ones um, so there is a real kind of appetite i think for change and reform and an openness to thinking about those questions in new ways and an openness to thinking about the kinds of critiques that anthropologists have been making for for a while mm -hmm. what can anthropological research and what do you think our anthropological research is going to be able to do in the coming years to help kind of make that appetite for change become you know, have, have a good outcome and lead to good change 
I think uh, one of the things is a kind of recentering of our understanding of what the economy is and what growth is uh, by taking seriously regional disparities and looking at more local led economic projects um, in order to bring, you know, a, a different kind of prosperity that is helping a wider range of households. That's also focused less on that kind of top down set of measures and more on the measurement of you know, how are our communities thriving? What supports are we giving our communities to thrive? Which would include, you know, supports for all sorts of things like childcare and healthcare that, that, that I mentioned before, but it's also supports to develop um, more radical and inclusive forms of community at the grassroots level. I think one of the things that we've all been amazed to see in the first wave and through the second wave is how communities have mobilized for themselves. Mm -hmm. And now the big question is, how do we keep that radical? You know, how does that not just get appropriated by the government mm -hmm. towards some terrible kind of big society project? How does that, how does that keep its radicalism? Um, and how do we rebuild in that way in a really devolved way? I think just adding to that, um, there's been new channels of two-way communication that have been opening up between policymakers, between people um, connected to the government and local level um, activists, people working in their communities to make change and to provide necessary resources um, like food um, just in this time of need. And I think we're, we're looking at how those things could be sustained in the future. Like Laura was saying also, how to keep people's autonomy and their freedom in terms of determining um, how resources are distributed in their local areas. And I think um, what's coming out of that too is, is just a greater accountability um, that's being required of the government when they're hearing um, the voices of people who have felt themselves to be marginalized. And we're seeing that now continuing with the vaccine rollout. Um, there's really a need for governments and for councils to listen to their local residents in order to meet, meet these data-driven targets um, that everyone is touting. So I think that's something that's going to um, con continue to be very important and hopefully that we can help um, um, ensure continue to happen. Well, I'm hoping that the kind of... Um air of activism will be sustained. I think the fact that Black Lives Matter, um, the data on disproportionate deaths of black women in maternity. I mean, there's been so much that's happened even within the time of COVID and within these lockdowns that has had to kind of be expressed in, in new forms. Um, and I just hope that that can, can be sustained moving forward and that these things can kind of flourish and, and be seen. That's kind of my, my hope. Yeah, I mean, I think what's clear to me is there's now an appetite for hearing people's stories and for mm -hmm. recognising the very kind of difficult circumstances that other people are in, uh, or maybe not even difficult circumstances, but just different circumstances and a willingness to put oneself in other people's shoes that the... The, the pandemic has opened up opportunities for that. Obviously, other things like Black Lives Matter as well. So mm -hmm. there's a real commitment now to let like, people telling their truth, but it's all very well for people to be telling their truth, but you also need to find a way to find patterns amongst these voices to work out how to balance different interests, mm -hmm. to think about what's shaping the way that people are experiencing things and to kind of find a way to um, systematize almost, and to do that kind of paperclip work of like, well, what do we take from all of this and what do we prioritize? And I think that's where anthropological skills of listening almost with two ears, you're listening to what people are saying, but you're also thinking about how their perspective on the world is shaped by factors and forces that mm -hmm. are beyond their control. Uh, and that's part of the social analysis. So I think that that listening work that anthropologists do and that interpretive analytical work um, really mm -hmm. is going to be very valuable in capitalising on this new sensibility of listening to people's voices and letting that lead us in an informed way. So it's an exciting time to be an anthropologist. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you to Melena, Caroline and Laura for joining us. Mm -hmm. And if you are interested in finding out 
anything more about our project, uh, we have a list of further readings. Yeah, so here you can see a whole range of research that we've been doing on the pandemic. We've got our uh, major flagship report, A Right to Care, The Social Foundations for Recovery from COVID-19. That gives you a very wide overview of the work that we've been doing in the UK. Uh, but then there's also some work here that relates to work that I've been doing uh, with colleagues in New Zealand on the social bubbles, our report Living in Bubbles during the coronavirus pandemic, uh, and then a couple of these other uh, articles as well if you're interested in reading more about that. Uh, if you do have any questions feel free to just drop me an email, my address is down there at the bottom, and uh, above all have a fantastic time at London Anthropology Day. Thank you for listening.